You're listening to Rev Up, a podcast about faith, family, and moto. I'm John Parkinson, president of Panic Rev Ministries. And I'm Zach Cummins, former Supercross racer. We're sitting down each week to talk with professional athletes about the unique crossroads of Christian life and action sports to offer you a view into the motivations that drive those at the top. Hey, welcome back. Uh, Appreciate you guys. Uh, Here we are, episode two of Rev Up. Uh, Myself, John, Zach, how are you doing this week, my my man? I am uh, doing as well as can be, I think. Another week inside. Uh, I got to visit with some family this week, so that was nice. A little bit of a change up. Uh, my, my grandparents live just a couple miles away. So we've been quarantining. They've been quarantining. We were all pretty confident that we were, we were doing well. So we went over there and just hung out in the backyard. Uh, that was a good change up. It was nice to, to see some people, some different faces. Uh, I've been staying with my folks during this period. So it's been tough just hanging out with mom and dad every day, all day. Um, we all get along well, but eventually, you know, you want to see some, somebody new. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Uh, yeah, we, we've uh, been doing about the same um, as, as before, riding bikes, doing, doing some family stuff, hanging out, working out uh, with the kids and uh, trying to get back in shape, you know, like, man, this is out of control. I am, uh, yeah, this is by far the most out of shape I've ever been, but I'm telling myself at least that I'm okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> focusing on, focusing on my studies and yeah. Um, That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, let's get to a little bit of moto on, on, uh, man, a little bit of bummer side of things. Um, you know, we, we had a death in the sport and, uh, his wife, uh, Marty Smith, um, honestly a legend to the sport for those that are, uh, fans and and been fans for a bit and like the history of the sport uh marty was the first 125 national champion um he has a lot lot in the sport and in whether uh sport or not like it's 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 a bummer bummer uh for the sport and his family so um yeah he uh yeah, I mean, absolutely. Within our community, a, a, a hall, AMA Hall of Famer, um, and yeah, I mean, to think a guy that had an influence. I mean, he he ushered in the era of Bob Hanna, like he mm. was pre Bob Hanna, is is super wild to me. Um, but yeah, uh, and I saw reports even on like New York Post and and some really big publications, like kind of shows you the spread that that someone like himself had uh, out into the world at large. So definitely tragic. Um, I'm bummed to hear about it. Uh, my understanding is that he, he passed away out, out in the dunes, um, off-roading. So, I mean, hopefully there's um, some, some, somewhat of a silver lining there. You know, I mean, we always say that those of us that are kind of living these dangerous lifestyles, um, that if there is a way we're going to go, we want it to be doing something we love. So, yeah. And, and um, I don't know if this is a good thing. Obviously, uh, having a family and whatnot, it's, it's a bummer to lose mom and dad, but absolutely uh they went together um so uh again it's it's a sad thing all in all uh but he was doing something that he truly enjoyed with somebody that he truly loved uh which is uh a cool thing um and neither one of them have to live from here on out without one another um again bummer but at the same time a a bit of peace in, in in that and knowing um that there's no sorrow on on either side definitely yeah um yeah moments like this really highlight the uh the family kind of uh nature of this community you see everybody trying to do what they can and and just acknowledging sending out their condolences and yeah i didn't i I never met marty personally but obviously i've heard a lot of stories my my dad's told me about him a lot and that he had kind of he was one of the first guys to have that beachy southern california kind of vibe um in motocross and and really was a huge figure beyond the sport like we were talking about uh, back in the seventies and and early eighties. So yeah, a lot of respect. For sure. I'm taking a little bit of turn and, and uh, still a bummer story and, 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 but it's where we are and, and uh, just the unknown of, of everything, let alone uh, this little sport that we, we all love of motocross, supercross. Um, the dates got pushed back yet again uh, for both supercross and looks like motocross as well. Um, supercross looks like it's, it, it's about May 31st, but at the same time, who really knows, uh, which is going to again, push motocross back even further. The news is that it is uh, racer X uh, posted that MX sports failed, are working together, which is 
in my opinion, really, really cool um, that they're actually uh, trying to work together and, and get schedules to work, work out for both series. I think, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, and I don't mean to be like uh, kind of pointing out the, the need there, but I mean, it, if we're all honest, I think uh, MX Sports and, and the Outdoor Series is somewhat at the mercy of the Supercross Series, and therefore they're going to have to follow that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good to hear that it's amicable, that it's, it's, everything's going smoothly. Um, it's really crazy to think with that, with that pushback that any idea of an off-season is, mm-hmm. is just kind of dwindling away um, as Supercross pushes back. And like you said, Outdoors pushes back. Uh, the, the preliminary kind of scheduling that I'm hearing right now is, is Outdoors from July through at some point in, in October. Yeah, which, and that puts you right at Monster Cup. It, yeah, and, and then you wonder, will Monster Cup run? And if it does, will they have to push to November? And yeah. if they do, I mean, are guys going to come out of outdoors and then have that same transition of like one week and you're right back into it? Or yeah. do you have any off-season at all? Yeah, and, and outside of the U.S., right? I was looking at MXGP. It's like, it, man, that series almost has to be done, right? Like traveling from country to country, yeah. um, the donations, all that kind of stuff, I'm assuming will be out. Yeah. With that, you have to wonder again about outdoors and will outdoors be able to function in the way that it has when we talk about supercross coming back, it's a little bit far fetched, but then, I mean, the idea right now, at least is that they'll be running in, in Glendale in Arizona, where there are not a lot of cases of COVID right now, um, that they would run in a, an empty stadium. They'd have a limited number of personnel. Uh, when we come to the outdoor series, you're not able to do that. You can't show up at the same outdoor track. There isn't that adjustability to make the track different yep. every weekend. So they're going to still at least right now, the plan is to keep moving around the whole country. Uh, There are a number of states that are not going to be able to facilitate that. Absolutely. So, yeah, you and I are in in California in the last round. It's the last round. So maybe um, is in, is that Paula or now Fox raceway Um, that, that to me even is a little far fetched, honestly, in, in California. Um, but, uh, that brings me, you know, somebody else that, uh, we could bring in and have a awesome conversation with as well. Um, our guest today is going to be, uh, our friend Trey Kennard. And, uh, right now he's going to be joining us and I want to welcome our man, Trey. Uh, there he is. Uh, Trey, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you guys? Doing awesome, man. Um, just, uh, trying to, enjoy the time with family and um, get to do some stuff that we don't normally get to do together as, as uh, we're all to, um, I think we're supposed to be staying at home. Um, <laughs> I stay around my home, <laughs> but we ride bikes and all kinds of fun stuff. So things are pretty good on this end. I, uh, I'm, I'm inside almost all the time. I mean, I, I have, uh, I'm working on my, my, my senior thesis as well, trying to finish up school. So Got a lot of work to do, but otherwise, I don't. I don't see the outside much. Uh, how are you? How are things with uh, like Oklahoma starting to open up a little bit now? Right? How is how has that change? Yeah, it's it's pretty weird. You know, here we're um, kind of like um, small town America in ways. So seems like the state's been a little divided. You know, like, and I, I would say a majority of people have been. It's kind of like business as usual, um, but there has been this stay at home thing. So. It's been interesting, you know, like I, I'm still trying to f- wrap my head around it all. But um, yeah, it's, it's been crazy. Like, I think the craziest thing is seeing people outside, like, you know, not really a, a state that's like known for exercise or, mm-hmm. um, you know, being healthy. But man, some of the trails, uh, bike paths and stuff like that have just been packed. So that's been kind of cool. I don't know how social distancing it is, but um, but yeah, that's been kind of kind of cool. So hopefully things going normal soon. John and I have joked about that a bit, that it took this time of us all being told that we couldn't be around each other for everybody to be like, oh, let's go on a hike together tomorrow. <laughs> um, I mean, there's people, like, cra- people that I didn't even know lived in my neighborhood, walk by the house every day and wave. So, it's kind of yeah, that's the same in our neighborhood. It's like, it's, it's like a constant flow on the sidewalk, you know? It's kind of weird. I didn't know most of these people lived here, but... Um, it's, it's mostly John. Whoa. <laughs> just getting as far out there as he can meeting everybody he can wearing flip-flops <laughs> absolutely the flip-flops don't come off man <laughs> uh have you been able to to ride at all have you been riding and and testing i mean you're still you're still doing testing stuff at this point i assume 
A little bit of riding, but not hardly any testing. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's impacted people in different ways, I'd say. But um, for the team, you know, I, I don't even know if the Showa guys are allowed to go to Showa. And so it's kind of limited, you know, like uh, Brian, our Shimizu, our, our suspension guy, his, uh, for, for Ken anyway, um, has just been going to Honda to build stuff. So, um, and then he's obviously got some time on his hands. So, um, you know, between him and Justin and Chase, they, they all need stuff too. So kind of limited resources right now. So I've just been trying to ride a little bit just to kind of stay a little bit sharp. But at the same time, I don't ride too much because I don't know, you know, how long parts are going to last and that kind of thing. So, uh, been been super weird. But um, but yeah, I ride a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. Zach and I just got done talking about uh, the series, man. Like, what what's going on with the series? How are we? Where are we going, man? Like, um, motocross, supercross, all these schedules getting pushed back, and what? Do you have any uh, idea what's going on there? No, I, I think I probably know as much as everyone else. Uh, you know, I'd heard of that outdoors, possibly Red Bud might be the first round. And then I heard another thing about the end of May, maybe starting Supercross. So, I, man, I don't, I don't know. And, it, and it's, it's, I think at this point, I don't think anyone knows, you know, because sure. it's, it's so uh, – there's not a lot of fact, you know, to really base your decisions on. So I guess it's everyone's kind of first pandemic. So yeah. we're all trying to figure it out together, I guess. <laughs> and are you kind of in a holding pattern then with like testing and stuff? I know you said you, you don't have a whole lot, but uh, as far as Honda goes, do you, you just kind of, yeah, on, on, on standby? Yeah. So we were supposed to test um, next week and everything is just continues to get pushed back, you know? So um, I just check in once a week, see how things are going and make sure I still have a job <laughs> and, uh, you know, see what the plan is for the future. So I don't know, it's, it's going to be interesting, especially next year with a new bike coming out and, you know, if that's going to be affected and, and, um, you know, how late racing is going to go, if we end up going into October, whatever yeah. that's going to be like. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy for sure. It seems like almost at that point, like, uh, a testing role would become so much more important to a team, you know, just like thinking of back, like I, I did a, a bit of it testing wise for, for the PC team in uh, 2017. And they had, a, if I remember correctly, we had a new bike come out right before that. And so I got on the bike way before anyone really was going to be riding supercross yeah. and was working on getting base settings for the chassis and all of that before the team came into riding it. Uh, it seems like right now, if, if outdoors runs all the way to October, like the testing side of building a strong foundation would become critical. Yeah, I think so. Especially with the new bike, you know, yeah. it's, it's one thing like the bike we're on now. I mean, I think we've got a pretty good base, especially supercross. Um, I think we really kind of hit some good strides this year during the season. So, so not too worried about that, but if, you know, if we got a new bike and then, you know, off season is going to be super limited and then I'm sure parts and, and production is going to be delayed. So yeah, it could, it could be a real benefit to have someone that can run through some stuff. So, I mean, that was kind of our play in the summer to kind of get ahead of the, the curve, you know, whenever it was coming to this new bike. But um, at this point, I mean, I don't even know when, when we'll be on it or, you know, what's going to happen with it. So um, I think it was supposed to do a production test like back in, well, around now, but obviously didn't happen. So yeah, I don't know, man. It's it's going to be kind of crazy, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure once it gets rolling, we'll all be ready for it, like a, a break. <laughs> yeah, I think once the floodgates open, man, it's going to be just wide open. Yeah, in that role, like uh, of testing, how close are you working with with uh, the guys, um, with Kenny and and uh, JB and those guys? Um, are 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 you kind of in their program, or how does that look on your end? Yeah, it's kind of, um, I would say, kind of touch and go with that. Like, like right now, I'm, I'm pretty removed, you know. It's like, it's almost like a bird of another guy to talk to, you know. It's like when you leave the track, you, you got to call a chassis guy, you got to call a suspension guy, and then to throw me in the loop, who I'm, you know, I'm really not going to offer that much during this time. But um, 
but I think, you know, when it, when it comes to the races being there, just being another set of eyes. And then, you know, when I'm there during the test, I think I can, I can be really beneficial because I can actually hop on the bike. Um, and that's kind of proven really helpful for, for Kennedy, for him to actually see someone riding his bike and kind of see what it looks like, even though we're different, you know, I still think it, it has some benefits, but there's times where I'm, I'm really engaged, I'd say. And then there's times where I can be a little bit removed, but, um, I think you just got to know when to, when to speak up, when to be a part of things and kind of when be able to, to pull back to you. Cause you know, the last thing I want to do is be the guy that's just, you know, nagging and, and kind of, you know, just being another, another, um, step on the ladder, you know, that you got to kind of deal with. So yeah, I, I just try to keep a good feel for that, you know, sure. but, um, yeah, probably a long winded way to answer your question, but yeah, I hope it makes sense. I, uh, I think back to like, I mean, I, I had a lot of fun in the, the bit of testing that I got to do. Like I said, I only did it for a year, but, but doing it with pro circuit. And, um, I think back to like bones is, is notoriously particular in the way that he wants to go about testing and having an order of things that he wants to work through. And so we had, uh, he, he called it the waiting area, but it was basically I'd come off the track. I'd give my feedback of how I felt about the adjustment. And then he had like an awning off the side of the box van with one chair. And that was my spot. And I had to go sit over there by myself while they made whatever changes they were going to make so that I didn't have like a bias going into mm. the new setup. And then I'd yeah. come back around. He'd say, okay, go ride. And I would go try something new. Um, I imagine they give you a bit more insight, trusting your feel more than that. But for me, it yeah. was like, they didn't want to, they didn't want to give me any sort of heads up so that I didn't have any, faulty output yeah no and and i i purposely don't want to know you know because um as much as you don't want bias it's just we're all going to have some sort of bias like no matter what and especially i've learned a lot over the last couple years about you know just different theory and and different ideas and so there's things that i lean towards so there's a if there's a part that maybe goes that direction i'll I don't want to know about it, you know, cause yeah. I don't want to be the guy that's like, especially when I'm not the guy racing, you know, I, I, yeah. I want to be able to kind of just be honest and say, I, I liked it. I didn't like it. It did this, it did that and not have to kind of defend my position on why I think it's good, you know, cause I, I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think that's good. I don't think that, you know, testing really works that way. It's not really an, uh, an objective thing. You know, it's, it's, to me, it's really subjective. It's not really, um, you know, black and white. And I, I think it can be in certain ways, but it's so opinion oriented, you know, oriented. I don't know if that's a word, but, uh, or- oriented or oriented. Yeah. yeah ornate. So. <laughs> but it is, I mean, it's yeah. like, I could like something in, in between myself jb chase now and ken like get four different answers about what it did or what they liked about it so my whole goal is just to be honest like that's if there's one thing that i can really shoot for is just honesty and i I think that's kind of a the best way to to go about it but yeah man that's a really good idea especially i don't know if you experienced this act but when you're developing something and then you're also at the same track the same box van with you know the other riders and they're like yeah. they're seeing it and you don't you don't you like can't tell them about it you can't really say much about it yeah. so i don't know I, that was the first thing i thought of i remember we were trying something with cole last year cole was there last year and he was like watched it and was like whoa that looked good he was like what is that and i was like ah. I, yeah <laughs> no i mean I, i've been there and, and kind of that yeah me me having an idea and, and i'm i'm pretty uh, I don't know if I want to give myself praise, but like just aware of what's going on and, and intuitive to what's happening. And I knew the guys and I knew the routine well enough um, that oftentimes I had an idea of what we were changing or an idea of what change we were going to. Um, and, and kind of hiding that from, from the riders around me, like you said, like having another guy that's there that doesn't know exactly what we're working on and doesn't really have that as an option quite yet. So yeah. like understanding what's going on a little bit and, and trying to keep, keep that looked about that. I can think back to a, a not putting any names in any order here, but like being partway through that season and a part of my benefit of testing that stuff with pro circuit, I was also racing at the time and was that I got access to a lot of those chassis parts 
um, that I wouldn't have had access to otherwise. Um, and I remember partway through the season, another rider like talking to me and being like, oh, like we just made this change. You got to try this version. It's unbelievable. And so then we talked to the guys at, at PC and I was like, hey, like, what about this? And they're like, oh no, that's the one you're running. We gave everybody two <laughs> options. You chose that one. This guy didn't choose that one. Um, they just like the one you like a lot more. Just had a bias going into it, having known that you chose it or whatever it was kind yeah. of the other way. Yeah. Um, hopefully that wasn't too vague with all of the ambiguity I left in it, but <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, my, my, my question is, is, and it's for both of you guys, but, um, I know the answer for Zach, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you're, you're at the same track with these guys and, uh, Trey, you're, you're retired <laughs> and your lap times are looking about the same as, as these dudes. Like, are you rethinking that retirement? You're like, man, I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> that man, there, there was some times last year. When I was like, dude, I feel good, you know, like I felt sharp and things were coming at me real slow. Like you get in that zone yeah. and, and, um, yeah, man, I, I was actually, I'm, I'm really grateful because last year, especially towards the end of Supercross, I was feeling really good. And, um, people kept saying, um, man, if someone gets hurt, like you're going to race. And, and I was like, dude, I don't even want to think about that. First of all, you know, I don't want to think about anyone getting hurt but when Cole got hurt last year um it was kind of a joke at first but it kind of turned into an opportunity for me so um they they kind of gave me a like a free pass you know race the races you want to race and do that kind of thing and I'm really grateful for it because you know I think there was a part of me that really wanted that but when I got it I realized that that uh maybe I didn't want it as as badly as I maybe thought so it was that was kind of the last time I remember going, man. I really want to race. So th yeah. this year has been a little bit different. Like I've kind of maybe accepted that chapter is kind of done um, and moved on to something that I also enjoy just as much too. So that's um, cool. Like I remember having that conversation with you right in in um, last year, and it, and I I asked the question, why are we going racing? right? Like if you go racing, why are we going to do this? Is it because you have an opportunity? Um, is it to go get another contract for the following year? Um, or is it just fun? Like, and is it worth the risk of, of having more fun, uh, than racing than going out and testing or practicing riding? Like, is the risk wor worth that? Right. And, and just putting it back there and, and, um, Say, man, where's God calling us, calling you? Yeah. No, I was super grateful for that because um, obviously the whole process is really difficult, maybe more difficult for some than others. But I haven't talked to anyone that said it's easy, you know, like um, pretty much everyone I've talked to about stopping racing has said it's been kind of an identity crisis mm -hmm. and difficult and they don't know what to do and it's like what do i you know it's a, pretty much the same response from everyone i've talked to so in that i'm like you know god where what's next for me you know what and there's still days that I, today i'm like i'm still not 100 percent sure what the next 20 years of my life looks like but not that anyone does but it's just so strange like from the time you're 10 years old until you know you're late mid twenties, you kind of know where you're going to be, what you're going to be doing some general sense of, of what's happening in your life to kind of not knowing anything. And so I, I really struggled with that. And, and even though at the end of when I call it quits, it was like, I, I kind of knew it was the right thing to do. I really craved that structure and, and kind of that, I guess, purpose, I guess, of, of what you're doing. And so I think I missed that more than anything. And, and, um, you know, kind of having that, like, it's almost like the Linus blanket from Charlie Brown. Like, um, I just felt comfortable in that space. So, but I'm really, really grateful for that opportunity because I think it showed me that, that in the end, like, I'm really content just being a husband, uh, you know, doing a job that I'm still passionate about, still get to ride motorcycles, get to be involved in things that I'd, didn't really get to tr be truly involved in when I was racing. Um, so yeah, I, I know that man, I'm, I'm windy, but, um, 
yeah, that, that was a really good opportunity for me to, to kind of, I think probably put that, that rest, that thought to rest finally, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, we, we obviously, and I'm, we're at totally different levels in this and I fully acknowledge that, but that identity crisis was something obviously like I, I, you said a lot of people have experienced when stepping away from the sport. And I think a large part of that is that starting so young um, and having that vision. And like, I think back to, like you were saying, I think I was earlier than 10, I was maybe eight years old. And I wrote this like uh, future timeline thing for my like third grade class, whatever it was. And uh, it was this big fold out deal and it had, you know, every five years and every 10 years and whatever. And, um, it went all the way to like me turning pro and then having this like illustrious career as a pro <laughs> motocross racer. And until I was like 18, it was all like in the timeline that I made when I was eight. And like, I remembered that and I was like, man, this is cool. Like I'm doing it. It's the vision that I had and it's working. And then, um, at 20, it totally changed. And I just like abandoned the timeline. And suddenly I had this difficulty knowing, who I was, like what, what value I had, what value I brought to the world. And, and that's where my faith came in huge and, and knowing that I, my identity portion laid somewhere else. Um, but then finding a passion to seek after each day is really hard. And that's why I think it's super cool. Like you say, you found work that you're able to do and you're able to do this work for a while now, right? You can see a, a career here and you're passionate about it. That's something I'm still, I'm still searching for. Like I was able to shift my focus to academics and focus on that. But now I'm, I'm getting ready to graduate in a couple of weeks and I'm applying for jobs, but like the job titles I'm applying to range pretty wide. Mm. I, don't, yeah, I don't know exactly what that is. Yeah. It, I think the thing that was, I relate to that so much. And I think so many people, I mean, everyone has to stop doing this competitively at some point, you know? Yeah. And that was one of the points Hannah had for me. Cause we, we talked about it and prayed about it a lot. She was like, you're going to have to stop racing at some point like (laughs) you can keep putting it off or you know um but i relate to that so much because you know we're around people that are very passionate you know in in racing it's like people do i mean sometimes dumb things just to go racing you know because they're 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 so into it they're so passionate about it Mm -hmm. but when you get into the like the normal world people are not that not, I mean, I wouldn't say that there's no passionate people, but most people are not that passionate. So it's kind of like, you see that and you kind of go like, man, is this kind of like, is this what's next? (laughs) It's, I get what you mean. And especially on the dumb side, like, I mean, there's, there's times where we'll have, you know, I mean, for me injuries or whatever it was, and you're like hiding these things so that you can get back to work and get back out there. I I just want to get back and keep doing it so that I can strive for it and, and risking life in doing that. And it's silly to do that for, you know, but that passion is so high that I can't imagine ever doing that for a real estate job and not to belittle real, realtors at all. I mean, obviously they're working hard and many people are passionate about it, but finding that, that thing that is like the key to your heart and working at it for 15, 20 plus years and then suddenly having to pivot away. Yeah. It, and I think one thing that, that's come away, I've come away from this anyway, is just, just really realizing how truly grateful i am for that because very i think very few people find that thing you know like that really it it kind of ignites their heart you know so um so it is a privilege and and while i you like mourn losing it i think at the same time you got to kind of like be so grateful that you ever found anything in your life that could really draw that out of you so but um yeah also the identity thing too because I would always say things like, you know, my identity is in Christ and, um, you know, wins and money and that stuff doesn't really matter, that kind of thing. But um, I think I was definitely, all of that that I'd put out was definitely tested in that, in that moment of stopping racing. So, um, but yeah, I think everyone, like whether you, you're, you know, one championship after championship or, you know, making it to the main or top 10 was your thing. Like we all go through the same battle, you know, I, being in the industry. Like I honestly don't think that uh, I've seen a, a people group as passionate um, than the motocross community um, racers and even fans, right? Like I have kids that, that play baseball in some crazy baseball parents, but um just like 
man, the, the industry as a whole, uh, the riders have so much passion towards the, 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 the sport. And, um, I, I turn and go, um, obviously not being a racer, go, man, what if we're able to turn that passion that we have towards this thing that we, uh, I'm going to say love and, 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 and do so often. What if we turn that passion into our passion for Jesus? And, and um, that's kind of, I, I love motocross, but I love Jesus um, so much more. And, and this is something that, that with Panic Rev, it's like, okay, well, let's add these two things together. But imagine like the passion that, that all the community has if we as a church, right we're able to put that type of passion into sharing our faith with with the lost mm. yeah I, I mean 100 percent. like and i think that's what i was trying to say a minute ago about the things that i'd said my identities in christ and yep. that kind of thing because i think at the at the end of the day it, i was it truly was and, and it, i think it was in ways but i don't think it was to the degree that i really thought it was so I think it was actually extremely healthy for me to, to kind of experience the loss of that. Um, because I, I think that the times in my life that I've really had to search and try to understand and seek God are the times that it really opens your eyes, you know, and you, you can kind of grow in those things. So, um, but yeah, absolutely, man. I think if, if we really lived out, our faith like we we do our racing and, and i think those two can incorporate um Absolutely. it's just difficult when you, you man you can get so consumed by it um yeah because it's i mean especially to be good at it you have to be a little bit consumed so um Absolutely. yeah no i think you're right though man for sure um we're gonna take a break right here uh we're past the 30 minute mark but we're about 30 minutes into our show um, and we take a break to uh, spend some time in the Word with our devotional dig, uh, where our guest will share his favorite, his or her, I guess, uh, five favorite Bible verse um, in the moment. Uh, so, Trey, would you uh, mind sharing that with us right now? Yeah, actually, let me get my, my Bible real quick. Yeah, it's kind of like, a, I don't know if it's exactly a verse. Um, Verses verses there's 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 kind of like a few that just have always been my favorite verse you know like um whenever um when people would come to me in, in autograph signings and they would say you know write your favorite bible verse there was a couple that always kind of stuck out galatians 6 9 was one of those you know do not grow weary in doing good uh for if we do not give up we'll reap a harvestness of righteousness or a harvest of righteousness. So, I mean, there's ones like that. Uh, Hebrews 4.15, um, if we do not have a high priest as an able to empathize with our weakness, but one that has been tested and tried just as we are, yet as without sin. I mean, those are kind of like keys for me, you know, ones that I can always lean on. But um, actually, I don't even remember what I told you. Uh, Mark 4. Mark 4, yeah. I know the story, 39. but I don't know the exact uh, verse. Oh. Yeah. 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 So, um, so Jesus it's, it's Mark three or Mark four 35 through 41 is kind of like the, the whole, whole story, but, but Jesus and his disciples are on this boat and, uh, they're, they're going across this lake and it says Jesus is asleep and, um, his disciples are, um, kind of going across the lake and a storm comes up and, everything gets crazy. Like they're, they're really scared. There's a big storm. Um, something that actually spoke on this a few weeks ago and the word for the storm that is used is this word megas, which is where we get our word mega. So it's just this giant storm comes up and, um, the boat is filling with water and it's, you know, not looking good. And Jesus is still asleep. And they kind of wake up, wake Jesus up, and they're like, um, hey, man, like, don't you care that we're going to die? Like, I, I don't know if they're, they think that Jesus is going to die too, but like, here's this guy sleeping through this massive storm. And then Jesus gets up, 
and uh, says that he rebukes the storm and that it's calm. It's, it uses the same word, megos, calm. So it goes from this giant storm to this giant calm. But the thing that I love about this is, is that Jesus is in the boat literally the whole time, you know, like, and I, I wonder like at what point did the disciples go to try to wake him up? You know, like, is it when they see the clouds coming? Is it whenever it starts to get a little choppy? Is it when it gets really wavy? Is it when the boat's filling up with water? Like they literally could have woken him up at any point in time. Um, but the thing that I love about it is that his presence is always there. And I think mm. for me, there's been so many highs and lows. And I think in this time that we're in now, it's kind of like this really flat time where really nothing's happening. But I, I just, what I really draw out of this is that his presence is always there, you know, and, and really the only thing that I have to do is go tap him on the shoulder, you know, and, and come to him. And, um, so I, I think for me that, I mean, this is a thing that's probably sp- spoke to me probably the most in the last month. Um, especially, yeah, I look back on my life and there's, there's these massive lows where I see God's evidence, you know, maybe it's through people or some type of comfort or peace or whatever that is. And then there's these extreme highs where it's like, that's a mountaintop experience and God was clearly there. And it's like, you know, high five Jesus, you know, glory to God, that kind of thing. But I haven't had many flat moments, you know, like this, where I'm just going like, yeah, Jesus was there, you know, but, um, but I think in this time, this, this story, this scripture kind of has really kind of, I've, I've, I've drawn to him, I think, in that he's there at all times. And all I have to do is seek him, you know? So uh, I, I, there's, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I I don't have anything else to say other than I was getting all crazy. I think that's huge in in us, right? Like we, in a high, a lot of times we'll go to God. In a low, we'll most definitely go to God, right? Um, But in this little middle area, we might just not be seeking God. But we always have to remember, like you said, that God is consistent, God is always there. It's us going astray, not him. He's always there. Um, and, and I think, at least in my early days, it's like, God, where were you? Where were you? And it's like, whoa, John, like, I was there. You didn't want me around. Um, and and uh, I think that's huge in, in so many of our lives to understand that God is always there. God is consistent. Um, it is us that that stray away and he's always going hey i'm right here i'm still holding your hand um just reach out and i and i'll get i'll get you yeah i think um that that's his promise you know he promises his presence like that's the last thing he says to his disciples when he's on earth you know he 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 sends them out he says go into all the world and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy spirit. And then the last thing he says is I will be with you mm-hmm. even to the end of the ages. Like, so, but I think we confuse his presence with, you know, either, you know, big moments in our lives, you know, where, where he's saying like, I will be with you always. And I'm, it doesn't really promise, you know, freedom from difficulty or anything. He just, but he does his, his, uh, his presence. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there's been so many times where I'm like, where are you, where are we at on that God? And, uh, he's like, dude, I was in the boat. <laughs> yeah. I was with you. All you had to do is tap me on the shoulder. I think, I think with that, like that, where are you at God? I mean, I can think of so many times, even in, in trying to share faith being like, and it was at that moment, like God showed up in my life and did, you know, did this calmed the storm kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, going back to that element of like suffering is, is promised here as well right? Like there's going to be storms for sure. Um, and to say that there won't be, or that it's always going to be calm is not like what this text is saying, but it says that he is there constantly and he is with you. Um, yeah. He's going to get you out the other side in, in some way in his arms. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, he's also sovereign to make it calm. Yeah. You know? Like 
he may not always make it calm, but he is the God of the water. He's the God of the storms, you know? So um, just, just to me that, I don't know, for whatever reason, that's just been just super comforting to me, um, especially in, and I, I don't ever want to compare my trauma to the trauma of other people, but you know, there's been things that have been difficult for me in life. And, um, and I think that when I looked at this, I can see that, He's not apathetic. It's not that he wasn't there. Um, he was there like the whole time and, and understanding that he was with me in all situations, like really just encourages me a lot. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And I think that's what you're saying, Zach, is like probably the, the argument against Christianity, you know, um, especially when you, when you think about, you know, maybe you're ag- agnostic or, or, you know, that, that is a lot of times the argument, you know, if you're, if you're a good God, how could you let these types of things happen? So, um, for me, this is, this has been something that has combated that, you know, and knowing that he's given me free will to do whatever I want to choose the things that I do and to, to race motorcycles, which is insane. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, and he promised me I'm going to be there, you know? So, um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I'm probably talking way too much. So <laughs> no, it's good. Um, but I, 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 man, it's so, um, I, one of the gnarliest things that, that, that has happened to, to you in your career, right. Is, is, uh, when you got landed on, you broke your back. Right. And it's so easy when when we look at those types of situations, especially as as a non-believer and go, where's your God now? And you heard that for sure um, in that moment and many other moments. Oh, where's your God? I thought he took care of you. I thought he loved you, blah, 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 all this stuff. Right. And then like we look back and look into those moments, just that moment itself. Right. So much came of you breaking your back. Um, no, it's not the most awesome thing that happened but god moved in a crazy way and did crazy things through that accident and and, and changed your life forever right not just the injury but i mean out of that came um a a, a mission trip out of that mission trip came a wife um and, and like that is just how god works like we can look at a situation and and have a pity party um or all right, God, where, where do you want me to go? How do you want me to get there? And what are you trying to teach me in this moment? And wh- where are we going now? Right. Uh, um, and I think that's huge. And uh, maybe you share a little bit about that, like how God used these crazy moments in your life. And Zach, you too, like maybe to wake you up from, from uh, where you were. Yeah. I, I know for me, um, it's like like this coronavirus thing you know it it's i know for me anyway it's it's shifted my perspective in ways you know it's like before this it was you know when it was going to most races there was tests in between that um hannah's in school you know she's super busy and so i mean it was just like we were just there's no time to really do anything other than you know kind of do what you got to do eat food go to sleep, you know, get, get your stuff in and kind of repeat. And so this whole thing to me has been a major, just a, a gift in that I have time to be able to slow down and, and actually think about what I'm doing and giving me a chance to kind of take a deep breath and, and kind of just look at things. Um, and I know through all the trauma in my life, that has had been the case. And and it's an, it's an amazing gift um, because I, I don't think anything can really slow you down that much like trauma can, whether it's uh, physical trauma, emotional trauma, whatever that is. It, it slows you down. It makes you think about what's happening. And I think that's part of the challenge of life is having the ability to stop and, and think about what you're doing. And so, I mean, that, that's been the, the greatest gift I think I've seen out of, out of my trauma, but I think our culture is so 
obsessed with avo- avoiding pain at all costs. I mean, like you don't go to the dentist without any type of n- nerve gas or I don't, well, not nerve gas. That'd be bad. <laughs> um, the laughing gas or laughing gas. You know, you don't, it's like, you've got, always got a bottle of aspirin. You've yeah. always got a bottle of ibuprofen. When you're sick, you want to pound NyQuil. It's like, we want to escape suffering at all costs. Um, because what, we, what we've set up for the ideal is, is to never feel any pain, but I think there's so much value in it. There's so much value in, in the difficulty. And I think that God can really use those to kind of shape us into the people. Like, I mean, I, I think this is true even outside of faith. I mean, I look at um, like Ken Roxon's story, for example, like the Ken Roxon today that I like watch ride and see his story I'm, I'm like a, a way bigger fan of this side of Ken Roxon's life, you know, cause I just, I see there's some depth to it. There's, um, there's something really beautiful about what he's, what he's been through. And I think that's the same way that God uses these types of things in our lives. And, um, and I think we've got to allow him to let us use those things though, you know, cause really easy in those moments to kind of, run away from him or blame him or whatever. But one of my favorite uh, proverbs is, is a man who digs a hole will follow into it. And a man who rolls a stone, it will roll on him. And, and I, this is probably way too simple to think about it, but when we do things, it's like th- there is a chance that those things can injure us or cause us some sort of pain, you know, like, when you, when you see the statistics of riding a motorcycle, you, you would know that there is a chance to get, to get hurt. So knowing that I don't, I don't blame God for anything, but I, I do know that he's taken those difficult things that have happened and has made something extremely beautiful out of them. You know, I, I think part of that is he loves to tell good stories. You know, like mm. if you read scripture, there's just a lot of really great engaging stories and so I think he can, he can take those moments in our lives and use them to tell a, a really good story. But um, yeah, I know for me, like, I'm sure it gets way overused, but like Romans eight twenty eight, you know, we know that, um, man, I'm losing it right now. If we know that God works for the good of those things, all, all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose and he definitely does use all things. And that's been the case in, in my life, you know, like breaking my back. I would do it again to meet Hannah. Like, I mean, our, our marriage has been like probably the best thing in, in my life in a lot of ways. So, um, better than Frank. Yeah, I'm still, there's some <laughs> days I still want, I want to take Frank to the Chinese restaurant and let him be lunch. <laughs> You should clarify for those listening that Frank is a bulldog. Not Frank is a not a human being. Not a human. But being. is it worse though? I might. I, I might actually. <laughs> just saying, it's not. It's not Trey's buddy next door that we just said maybe he loves more than his wife. His no, I love Frank. It was oh, total, never... total joke. Total joke. Yeah, yeah. Hannah's way better than Frank. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I don't know. Does, does Hannah snore like Frank? No, I've never heard her snore. Actually, well, that's that's yeah. better in itself. Yeah, Frank snores like a freight train. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know. I just, and I, it's, it's hard to say this to someone that's in difficulty, you know, cause, cause there's really nothing you can say that can, um, empathize, nothing that can really kind of communicate that you understand the weight of what someone's going through. But I do know from, from my experiences that the, the pain and the grief this, you know, kind of disappears at some point and that on the other side of that, like God can really use it in, um, in a really powerful way. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I got to say. I don't know what it's worth, but <laughs> I, uh, I, I share your perspective on a, on a great deal of that. I mean, I think it should be noted that like when you talk about this time as a, as a gift, this time right now as a gift, I know that you, you say that from a place where you've experienced tragedies in your own life and you've seen how God can work all things for good. Um, and so with a full understanding of, of how tragic this situation is, I'm still feeling that God can triumph even that. Um, 
I know in my life, like we can only speak from, from our experiences of tragedy. Right. And that's the fullest we can understand it. It feels like, um, in my life, I had the, the, the head injury that I had in, in 2015 where I was, I was in a coma for about a day and a half and then came back and, and was, was, it took me many months to like get even just day to day memory it took about a month, right. To remember the day before. And then it took a while to like totally walk normal. Um, and there was this, like, it was a huge, huge tragedy in my life where I had no idea who I was or who I was going to be um, if I would ever do any of the things that I loved again. And so for me, like, that's the biggest tragedy that I've experienced. And, and I've talked to people since who ask me, oh, so you're a Christian. Like, do you think God did that or the devil did that? Um, and I, I personally don't land on either side. I, I think God is sovereign over all things. I think he can make happen or stop from happening, whatever he chooses. But I also do believe in free will. And I think the mistake that I made while riding a motorcycle was something that I made a mistake doing. Um, and I fully own that. But I'm at a point now where I almost want to give God the credit for it because I know all the work he did with it. And I think that's the beauty of giving these things to him. Um, we can have horrible, horrible tragedies, huge low points in our lives. And when we give them to him, all of a sudden he can turn it into a gift and he can create something you know, beautiful out of it. Um, my trajectory changed greatly. And at that point, I, I was eventually able to return to racing, like you guys know, but like my passion was not quite the same. My ability certainly wasn't. Um, and, and I had other head injuries as well. And eventually that compounded because that's just a reality of head injuries, unfortunately. Um, and somehow that was the catalyst for me then like going to school and getting into a phenomenal, a phenomenal college. And that doesn't make any sense without God or this divine intervention that like kid that is in a sport, which is not notoriously known for well-educated individuals hits his head a bunch of times and then suddenly can go to an Ivy league school. Like that feels like God to me. Um, but yeah, I think the key part is like handing those things over to him. Right. And letting him do his work with them. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's the difficult part, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think, Part of the reason is, is there's some sort of um, resistance, you know, because I think what, what, we've, what we've set God up to be in a lot of ways, especially, and then, and then, you know, not pointing fingers at anyone, but I think kind of the Western church, like the American church has, has kind of set God up as kind of a, a behaviorist, you know, it's like, um, do good, good things happen to you, do bad, bad things happen to you. Um, yeah something bad happened, you must have caused it. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I it's think... Like, it's like on? in the Old Testament, it's like, oh, did your mom sin? Is this from... Why are you paralyzed? Why do you have the sickness? And it's like, We see that, yeah, in Job. And Job, his, his friends start to abandon him because they're like, dude, a lot of bad stuff's happening to you, Job. Yeah. You must have run over a nun in the truck or something, buddy. Like, this is not okay. Right, right, <laughs> right. And I, I think it's, it's part of human nature, you know, like... God has kind of built us in this way, you know, because I think we need to make sense of why things are happening, you know, but I think what happens in, in our lives is that we kind of, we try to make it so black and white that we don't take time to wrestle with it, you know? And so when, when we, when we go through trauma, kind of our quick response to God is, you know, why did you let this happen? But we probably will never vocalize that, you know, it's kind of a, a, subconscious thought that we never really want to say because that's taboo, you know, but I think what I've learned is that God wants to hear those moments. You know, he, he wants me to ask him those questions, like read through the Psalms and you'll see what David, like the things that King David said to the Lord in song and prayer. Like I look at and I'm like, dude, that's, that's bold. Like mm. he calls him out. Like he calls a friend out, you know, like, where were you at on that? And and I think God wants us to hear that because then I, th I think what he wants more than anything is relationship and for us to engage with him. And um, I think when we can help process our grief in him, I think we can lean on him and I think he can do like wonderful things through that. So um, I, I think that's so important. I, I, I'm right there with you. Um, you know, I've had conversations with you, uh, other people um, in the same in the same realm of man, are you angry at God? 
right? And it's like a little bit. I'm pretty bitter that that this happened to me, right? Um, let that be known to God. Express that to God and let him know, hey, Lord, I'm pretty bummed out at you. Like God already knows that you're angry and you're upset and there's bitterness in your heart, right? Like imagine having that type of relationship with a friend that either is upset at you or you are upset with them. Um, it's not going to be the greatest relationship. And it's the same thing with God. God wants us to be authentic with him and to have this true relationship with him. Um, so if we are angry, if something's going on uh, that caused that bitterness, um, I think it's it, super important to express that to God and have that open relationship, even if you're screaming at God. Um, I, I think that is so healthy. And, and, and Trey, as you said, in Psalms, like there are so many times where, where, where King David is just like letting him have it, right? Yeah. yeah I think it's huge, man. I, I think we're resistant to it because it's, it, I think it's considered taboo. You know, like I think, sorry, Frank's seen a mailman or something. So you might hear Mark. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's, it is a, it's taboo. You know, if you like, if you go to your, your Christian friend and you say these types of things, he would probably go like, why would you ever think that? You know, so we don't give it room to really grow um, and for you to be able to verbalize that and that kind of thing. But I also think there's a great power in, um, in that kind of belief as well. You know, because if I am good, good things are going to happen and it gives me some bit of control over my life, you know, um, or if I'm, if I'm bad, I can kind of keep my head down and kind of keep a look around and, you know, things are going to happen. But, and I, I think what God wants more than anything for us is to go like, God, you're in control. Like I, I need to give that over to you. Like you're, you're literally there all at all times. So for me to think that I have some sort of control of, of how things are going to go. And, and I know you do have some bit of, um, what do you, what do you call that? You would probably know that Zach, um, li not licensed, but, um, Oh, Zach, anyways. no, not me. I don't know. I, yeah. Well, I mean, Columbia. That's yeah. a fair <laughs> assumption, John. You go to Harvard, right? <laughs> Harvard. <laughs> Ouch. It, um, it, uh, agency. I don't know. It, it, we, like we do have some sort of control about what happens in our life, but sure. I think when we try to reason through trauma like this and say, you know, okay, if I'm just good, you know, if I just train hard and I just, and I don't cuss and I don't, yeah. then I'm going to be good. I think that really sets us up for failure when, when bad things happen. Um, and kind of the, the opposite or the opposite side of that is, you know, when we're bad, we just think automatically, you know, God's going to blow us up. So I think there's, there is power in that belief, but I think what God wants more than anything is, is for us to, to look to him and to be like John said, you know, authentic with him and real and for it not to be about if things good or bad happen, but to be about him and having a relationship with him and his purpose and his will. Something I, I wonder about Trey and not to like point this back at you again, but like for me, my, my spiritual growth, my spiritual maturity came really right at the very end of my, my racing and, and being really devoted to racing. Uh, but as I understand your career, like your walk has been there for a long time throughout this experience and you raced at a professional level and, and were really aggressive and like a hard racer and fought tooth and nail all the way through. Um, like, and I know this is a huge question, but in some regard, how that impacted your your ability to race hard being that you had this spiritual understanding and and this like brotherly love as a christian um but then still going out there and 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 fighting the way you did i mean for me they don't seem contradictory but i know some people struggle to find that middle ground and i just wonder being that you had to really take that on at some point i'm assuming with your yeah your no i mean i wrestle with it for sure i think and I think I've kind of alluded to this a little bit and kind of the like we've been talking about this kind of suffering topic um, but, um, I think we always want to have things figured out, you know, like that's kind of our nature is to have, uh, control, I guess. Yeah. But I think so much of faith is wrestling with things, you know, it's, it's, um, in, in who, who, how would we really think that we understand God, you know, like how would we really truly believe that we just got them all kind of neatly typed away in a, 
perfect little package. But I think there's so much value in wrestling with this. Um, you know, like I remember in 08 St. Louis, um, you know, I crashed an RV, you know, he hit the pole, I won the championship and I went to bed that night, like sad <laughs> because, you know, I didn't see the replay, you know, it wasn't a time and space where you could just hop on Instagram and see what happened. I had to wait like a week to even see the race. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, to say that I haven't really, I didn't really just figure it out and just like live out of that, you know, but I do think when I look at it, like when I think about what Jesus tells us, you know, he says, love God and love your neighbor, you know, love, love the Lord we God with our, your heart, your mind, your soul and strength. And he says, love your life. The second greatest commandment is this to love your neighbor as yourself. When I think about how I would want to be loved whenever I raced, I would race, I would want to be raced the way I race people, you know, because if someone were to just kind of let me by and, you know, just kind of like, oh, you know, this is yours for the day. Like you just take it, you win. You know, I, I won last week. You can win this week. Like I, I would find no fulfillment in that. And yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, I wouldn't find much joy in that. And so when I think about how am I going to serve my competitor, I think it's that I race him really hard, you know, like I race him aggressively, not overly aggressively, like obviously didn't mean to clean RV out. I wanted to race him hard. Um, I, didn't, I never meant to clean anyone out, maybe once or twice, but, <laughs> but never like I, very few times in my career am I like, I'm just going to clean this guy out. It was usually because yeah. I was mad and kind of lost my temper. But when I th think about like, racing someone and serving them as my neighbor, loving them as myself. Like I would, would want to race the way that I, the way that I raced. So, and maybe that's me trying to rationalize this and put it all together in a tight little box. But I, I do think that's when I keep coming back to this, that's still the same belief. It works. It works for me. I mean, obviously I want it to, but like I, <laughs> I, I think of my most fun races are, are, not necessarily ones where I actually got put on the ground, but sometimes ones where a guy tried to, right? It was a close race. At the very end, he, he came in as hard as he could and, and slammed me. And then we, we bumped bars and did whatever else. It was really aggressive. And then to cross the line and say, like, hey, man, good race. Yeah. Um, I was one that never carried that off track. And I, at least in your career, I haven't seen you do that either. Um, to kind of say, hey, I'm racing as hard as I can. And as soon as we're done, we're done. That's it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I find that to be the most fun racing. I remember when I very first came back to racing after my head injury, I did the, uh, the trans world slam and it's that really short, like two lap. It was on a super cross track at the time. And, um, it's just an all out sprint for two laps you and one other guy. And I was at milestone and I had Nick Schmidt paired up against me and it's first round. So it's like, this is, I mean, I think I did one REM race. Otherwise I had a horrible concussion, nine months off one REM race. And then now going to the gate, uh, with Nick Schmidt at milestone for two laps. And we banged bars like crazy and it was super hard and it was super gnarly and like probably the most contact I've ever made with someone. But also I think back is one of the most fun races I've had. Um, so yeah, long winded, a bit of a deviation, but I mean, I, in that regard, like if you're thinking serve your competitor, like that is what racing is all about to me. Yeah. And, and for me, like that was, that was a huge chunk of it. But the other side of that too, is that, um, you know, I, I really just wanted to do my best, you know, like when I look and I still look at my life mm. and I think, how would, how does God want me to approach this life? And I, I think he wants me to be the very best that I can be, you know? And I think, um, maybe I over efforted sometimes, you know, but, um, I don't, I can look back and say like I, that I really did my best, you know? And I think he, he calls us to that you know, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, you know, and, and do it with all your heart. So I, I think for me, maybe I got caught up in that too much sometimes, but I really am grateful that I, that I did because I, I don't look back at many times in my career where I can say that I really didn't do the best that I could. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. Like I look back on some of the hardest fought races that I had. And if I won, or even if I didn't win, like they were still just some of the most fun that I, that I had racing. 
I, I think that's key is, is understanding that we are called to uh, give God glory in everything we do. And the only way to do that is to do our very, very best in everything that we do. Um, so when I let up, uh, because I might come in contact with my competitor, um, am I truly giving God everything that I have in that moment? And, and I am for one to say no, right? I have, a, I have the opportunity to give a little bit more in this corner or whatever. Um, I need to do that because God calls me to give him my very, very best. And that is glorifying to him. I'm going to quote you on that next time something happens. Hey, you could quote me all day. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that note, like e- I- even riding fifties in your barn. <laughs> you always go back to that. Hey, John beat me one pit bike race in my barn. Hey, hey, what happened? You beat me. Okay. <laughs> That's right. This yeah. guy right here. John beat you. It was, it was over 10 years ago. Hey, is that like a fat joke? Like I put on a few pounds. Maybe I can't do it now, but I did beat you. <gasps> you did. You did. <laughs> it was fun though, right? We hit each other. It was a, a blast. Times. It was a blast. Is this just the two of you in a head-to-head barn match or were there other competitors? No, it was just him. Yeah, I had, I had two, 50, two or three fifties, but I think we would go two at a time. Yeah. And it was like, you know, death match. It was just like a little horseshoe, but dude, it was <laughs> holes in the wall. That boy barn for sure but uh man it was a lot of fun john gets uh john gets aggro i remember back to uh what was it south south carolina uh camp rev panic rev camp we played the the heat game in the rental car (laughs) you remember this trey and i I don't uh, think any of us will ever forget business john got really (laughs) mad at me about i don't know probably two and a half hours into sitting in that rental car with the heater full blast windows up yeah that was torture man i don't know why we thought it would be awesome i don't even know how it came up um i think zach brought it up but yeah it was a competition uh, we none of us were really i think kyle peters was in there he was still racing the rest of us were deprived of competition for a while and so i just thought hey let's compete let's (laughs) turn the heat up it's already 87 degrees outside yeah with with like humidity of 90 (laughs) (laughs) for you guys who don't know we played a stupid game uh, we, we, we drove around for a little bit and then we just sat in a parking lot with a heater on, uh, just cranked with what, like six of us. I would say six or seven. Cause we had yeah. too many for the seats. Cause I think yeah. Kyle Peters was in the, uh, like the hatchback trunk area. <laughs> yeah. That was in my rental car, by the way. How do we yeah. turn that I feel bad for oh, whoever, yeah. whoever, whoever had to clean that sucker. The next that was, yeah, uncool, it was, yeah. it was sticky yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. We, 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 uh, it was not a pretty sight. Trey, Trey got out. And he said, just bring me the keys when you guys are done. You guys are done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm competitive, but this is just dumb. I'm he was in there for a while. In his defense, he was there for, I mean, I don't know if it's a defense or maybe I'm making him look bad. I mean, if I tell you he sat in the rental car for over an hour, I don't know if that's defending him. But <laughs> I think if it hadn't there. been so late. I, I think he went to bed. It, yeah, it, was, was it was past midnight for sure. Yeah. And then we had to get up the next morning and yeah. do camp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get pretty grumpy when I'm tired. <laughs> that's funny that was yeah. rough trey you mentioned uh 08 uh i wanted to touch on on it real quick um just because it's it, it's it's so big and talking to like osborne uh when he goes back and watches vegas um and the feelings he gets and and you mentioned like i was bummed going to bed that night right like that is crazy in my opinion i never won a supercross championship so um to me, that's that's nuts that you're bummed that you uh, yeah. in the way that you want it. Um, do you now go back and watch it and like get goosebumps and like, man, that is awesome. Yeah, I, for sure. I, I think um, I look back at the whole season and I'm just like, that is so cool, man. Because I mean, the championship was won on that night, but it really was won round one leading two. up to that. Yeah, so. But man, it's so cool. Like my, I don't know how I maintain that level of focus because I look back on it, man. I was like locked in. My my slogan that season was two hundred percent. I mean, and, I mean it was like I was kind of over and beyond. And I was burnt out by the time that short seven race series was over. But 
man, it, it was, it's really cool to look back on. And um, I, I think more than anything too, like when you're racing with someone and something happens, some sort of contact, it's really hard to know exactly what happened, you know? So it's like, did I do anything? I don't know really what I did. And then I got some pretty bad heat from, you know, uh, from Ryan's crew. So I was, you know, being Ryan come over and like yell at you or anything after. No, no. I mean, everyone was just fired up. You know, Mitch was fired up. His mechanic was fired up. So, um, so I'm I'm just, I'm such a like a pleaser, I guess that I just couldn't bear the thought of people being mad at me, you know, but when I look back on it and I, I analyze the past, no one takes anyone out with a rear tire. Like my front tire didn't (laughs) touch him at all. So feel good about that and then also <laughs> shoot man it was my rookie season like to win yeah. how many rookies have won a championship do you know i know that ernie did it okay but other than that i'm not 100 percent sure um have, who, have done it have you and rv had to sit down since then and, and talked about that or not really no Still no every, i mean her subject with rv he, it didn't seem like we really talked for like i remember the first time i had like a really good conversation with him was in my first 450 race in Anaheim, we were doing opening ceremonies and it was kind of like, he was nice to me before, but like never would be like, Hey man, what's up? You know, I remember I was sitting in this, in a tunnel on the far side and he was coming out after me or something. He came up and he like, Hey dude, what's up? You know, what's going on? I'm like, what, what's happening right now? Um, but we never really talked about that, that past, but, uh, it's funny because I hear about it a lot, and I'm sure he does too. So. Yeah, <laughs> maybe he does. He did it way, way cooler things than 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 uh, that path. So well, we should keep it relevant. So so uh, uh, it, he he could keep on thinking about it. I, man, he thinks about it. That's the one that got away from him. Some rookie sixteen <laughs> year old kid coming out of nowhere. We're in a runs we're in a me, chest protector into- <laughs> with the Lee <Liette> tucked in. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I mean, so like, obviously that race is the bit you talk about, but like the first three, four rounds of that season also were just unbelievable. Like as a little kid watching you come out and do that, like it was an awesome season in general, like yeah, that man. led to that moment to, yeah. How about it's the crazy. jet ski race in Daytona? Yeah. 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 That was crazy. Uh, Atlanta was obviously crazy. Like I hadn't, I really thought maybe I'd get like fifth or sixth, you know? And then I qualified Atlanta was first. round one. Yeah. I qualified first and then I won my heat race. And I'm like, yeah. dude, what's happening? You know? Yeah. And before I know it, I'm like standing on the podium at one, like super weird. Um, it's cool too. I was so young. Like I was, I was 17, you know? So yeah, it's weird to look back and like my brother, my younger brother's 18. I'm like, dude, he was, I was a year younger than him and racing supercross. It's kind of weird <laughs> to, to think about, but, um, yeah, I'm I'm extremely grateful for it. I, and I think in ways it set me up for kind of the rest of my career to have a ton of pressure. Um, but I wouldn't trade it, you know. I, I think anytime you can win a championship, like you better take it and run and, and uh, be grateful for it. And um, yeah, I, I think it was really cool. For sure. Honestly, Trey, we could sit here and talk all, all night. Um, and I would love to, uh, you know, we're, we're going to wrap things up for the night. And um, with that said, though, uh, we would love to get back to this at some point and, and have you back on uh, if you have had an okay time <laughs> hanging out yeah. with us. Uh, I would love to do that. Um, but uh, before we close up, we got uh, a final five that we would love to go over with you, um, which we're going to close every show with. Uh, just some five, five random questions that people might be interested in, uh, things that aren't always asked. Um, and, uh, hopefully they're fun for you. Cool. You get I, uh, I, uh, I curated the final five this week. So oh, if, sweet. I could, if I could throw them at you. <laughs> now I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first one. And, and I mean, right off the back of that, that 08 season, uh, who was your biggest rival? My biggest rival, man, that's a good question. Do you identify someone as a rival, I guess, is another way to put it. I mean, I hope so, right? You're retired. You can speak to that now. Like, Yeah. 
I'm, I'm racing, just trying to hard. trying to think like want to think about kind of oh, dig you, through the guys I raced. You could go. I mean, you the two real big ones that that you have a little issue with is is RV <laughs> that we already talked about. Yeah, and then there's Chad Reed. You know, calling him a crybaby and that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm embarrassed about that story. <laughs> but you, with that, like I'm trying, I'm trying not to go any deeper. But yeah. seriously, you called him a crybaby. What can anybody come back with, right? Like, what's a that is with? true. That is true. <laughs> I mean, what do you say to that? And he really had nothing to say. <laughs> I can't imagine being post race, having had the night that you guys had that night, and then just like coming at a guy with the anger that I can only imagine he had at that moment, and then having someone just be like, "You're a crybaby," <laughs> you know, like just filled with rage as an adult, and then another adult just being like, "Dude, stop being a crybaby." <laughs> I remember I so I grab I got my mechanic on the back, Brent, and we're riding back, and he's like, "Dude, what did you say?" Like you were like, point your finger at him, <laughs> screaming and shaking, like dude, what do you say? And I was like, call him a crybaby. <laughs> he was like, are you seven? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, but I think, and, and maybe it didn't look like this, but um, I, I looked at a dungy like in this way mm. for whatever reason. I, I think probably because we were so close and um, kind of proximity growing up. You know, we kind of, neither one of us really had this illustrious amateur career. We rode together a lot. Um, so I kind of looked at him and saw what he was doing. I was kind of a year behind him and I kind of like almost looked at him as like my competition, you know? So um, he obviously way outdid me, but um, uh, I don't know. I, I always looked to him and I really admired him. So um, I don't know if that's a, a good thing to say about a, a rival, but I always looked at him and I really wanted to, I wanted to beat him and, and, um, you know, I just admired him so much, you know? So I thought, man, if I could, if I could beat that guy, that would be, I would, I would be really doing something, you know? So. That's awesome. I wouldn't have expected that at all. That's, that's a, yeah, that's wild. If you kind think of, about kind of it random. though, like just knowing, knowing the yeah. history a little bit, like you, yeah, you guys race each other in, yeah. probably in the eighties, but when you guys got, when you got on big bikes, you started blossoming and and you guys race each other as amateurs in in for at least a year because i, I think he only rode really one year in b and then he got pulled up or whatever yeah oh, oh five oh six we rode together a lot he he trained with the same guy i trained with and so um you know you'd be doing the i race you know you'd look over mm -hmm. oh he was on that double last, that last lap yeah. or whatever yeah. and so it was kind of like a competition we were both figuring out training kind of the same time and i i, I kind of looked at it i don't know if he looked that way but i would i would kind of <laughs> look like okay he's doing that let's see if i can kind of you know maybe do it differently or different and you know, better or whatever so these final fives really are supposed to be a quick thing but I oh, that was a good that was a good answer you can't cut no, that no, but the next no, one will be short no I, I i'm adding even more that's why i'm putting that, that was in. a Not great question great. i who curated these five? Oh my I gosh i actually did that one if we want extremely to be intelligent no you, no you what uh, i don't recall you doing that I'll, one. I'll put a screenshot up with our text I, messages i've hit my head um, a few times but i don't remember that <laughs> I will never forget. I only went once, but I'll never forget you and Dunge at Branson um, and going at it uh, on, on, in the B class. Yeah. Branson. Of all yeah. Branson. I came out on top that week. You, know, you did. Yeah. Hey, and, and then at the, at, at the time <laughs> I was working for cares Magnum. about it. And then made Branson Pull 05. I beat I Branson. <laughs> that video is out there on VHS somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I was working at Final Lab at the time, and and, and so I, I remember it because uh, at the next quote unquote amateur national at, at, at Minios, uh, Trey got on the cover. So uh, that's kind of how I remember that. Yeah, it was fun. We it was it was cool, but yeah, it's cool. It's still cool to you know I still admire him so much. He's a he's a really good person, and um, yeah, it's cool to kind of have come up through the through our careers in a similar way, similar time, I guess. It, Obviously, didn't win four Supercross championships, but yeah. <laughs> uh, next one is uh, your favorite band. Hopefully, that's a bit easier to answer. Yeah, I think um, I did a Zoom call earlier this today, and they were talking, asking me about music. And I'm like, dude, I'm so all over the place with music. But um, my answer was uh, United Pursuit. Um, they have a oh man, did I just lose you guys. No, we're here. Good. Okay, I just got a my computer did something funny. 
but United Pursuit, there's a there's an album called The Simple Gospel, and um, it's just like the best music that I I really enjoy. It. It's super chill, and um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your uh, favorite way to pass time on a road trip? Mm. I mean, growing up in this sport, obviously we do a lot of big road trips cross country, going to amateur nationals, and we've all got our routines. Yeah, I, I, a certain crowd is going to really like this, but. Um, MX versus ATV Unleashed was like my jam, dude. I think I had a 50 on Philadelphia, if that sounds right. Ooh. It was the track that ever, it was like, hey, you'd gauge someone, their skills on, you'd be like, so what's your lap time at Philadelphia? <laughs> Adam, Adam Sansarulo is whipping out a memory card right now to check it back. <laughs> we went, we went so hard on that back in the day. And, and you're like, it's a 48. You're like, he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> Not possible. Oh, that's awesome uh all right uh if you could close one fast food joint for having the grossest food which place would it be mm. Mm. Hmm. man probably denny's all right i've just been to okay so in the last year i've been to some really rough denny's and i just thought no one should eat this food I thought this would be controversial, but I feel like most people are okay with that. Yeah. If we got rid of Denny's, I think people would be all right. Yeah, because Denny's I, is kind of a place you don't really choose to go to. It's kind of like it's open. <laughs> you know. It's like, what else are we going to eat? But we yeah, went to one I'm after St. Just... Louis this year at like 1230 at night, and it was like, it was really bad. St. So. Louis, dude, why wouldn't you be in Waffle House? Uh, yeah. No, nah, yeah, couldn't find choice. one. Yeah. Bad choice. Yeah, I saw a. Put that on you. I saw a photo the other day of a Denny's, and they have on their sign, "Denny's, we're always open." And then, obviously, with the pandemic and all that, there was a lettered <laughs> sign below that said "closed." <laughs> <laughs> They're probably still open. <laughs> the moon's over Miami. Uh, last one: uh, Supercross or outdoors? If you could ride uh, only one from here on out, which would you choose? Mm, man my answer to that is always both because really um yeah because i just i think it's so cool that we get to do we get to split our sport up you know like you don't have to do the same thing all year round um i would say motocross though like, especially as i've gotten older like not that i'm old but um well you're getting there i'm i have some grace they're happening <laughs> um i don't know it's just something super relaxing about going to ride motocross like mm. supercross you got to be kind of like keyed in you know like you always kind of be like on your game motocross you can kind of go out with the boys and have fun and you know you can be thinking about other things which is probably not don't do that but <laughs> i don't know it's just really relaxed i think yeah. like thinking about just doing it for fun that's really cool sure if all supercross tracks were perfectly prepped i would choose supercross because riding a fresh supercross track is like nothing better yeah yeah that's I what i think of. i think i think all. no you did you did i mean i well you chose right you just were reluctant mm -hmm. i think i would choose the other way i think i uh like you said that fresh supercross track to me is there's nothing quite that compares but yeah. imagining a world of of just doing laps forevermore you know outdoors has that kind of free ride component to it as well yeah so. just it, the whoops get sketchy you know and maybe that's just being the, the test guy that's still there at like four in the afternoon. And it's like, you're riding through like a stack of pickaxes, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that gets hairy, but man, some fresh supercross whoops too. That's some fun right there, man. I love that. Definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Trey. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Yeah. Yeah. I truly appreciate it, man. Uh, appreciate you. Appreciate the man that you are and uh, the role model that, that you have been to so many and continue to be in our sport. Um, it, it, it's, it's an honor to have you as a friend, as, as, a, as a person that, that we're able to do ministry together and uh, as a group. So truly love you, man. I appreciate you. Um, and we will for sure carry on this conversation and pick it back up uh, another time. Cool, man. Thanks, guys. I, I really appreciate you. And Man, it's so good to see you guys. I'm stoked. I haven't seen you in so long. So uh, yeah. thanks for, for doing this. For yeah. sure, man. Appreciate it again. Love you, brother. And uh, have a good night.
Yeah. Love All you guys. Right. Love you guys. See you later. Yeah. See you, See dude. You. Thanks for tuning in to Rev Up. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any new content. Check us out every Thursday at 5 p.m. And if you're interested in learning more about Panic Rev, head over to panicrev.org or follow us on Instagram. Until next week, I've been John Parkinson. This has been Rev Up. Stay healthy and God bless.